Hello, and welcome back to the 2024 SIVA Award Celebration. I'm Kaden from Iron U.S. Elementary School. Thank you for joining us once again for the SIVA Finalist Reveal. Remember, you can stream and connect with us at secctv.org and by using the hashtag SIVA Awards. And now, I have the honor of sharing the SIVA 2024 finalist in the instructional category. The instructional category focuses on videos that teach about a subject, a skill, or gives how-to advice related to an educational topic. Let's take a look at this year's instructional finalists. In the K-3 instructional category, the finalists are Charge Your iPad, Mary Hill, Elementary and Middle School, Honey Lemon Ginger Remedy, Florence Markoffer Elementary School, How to Be a Good Big Brother, Florence Markoffer Elementary School, How to Make a Cup of Noodles, Florence Markoffer Elementary School, How to Make a S'more, Florence Markoffer Elementary School, How to Make Friendship Bracelets, Florence Markhofer Elementary School. How to pitch a baseball. Florence Markhofer Elementary School. Making and selling rubber band bracelets. Florence Markhofer Elementary School. SRC. Florence Markhofer Elementary School. In the grades four through six instructional category, the finalists are Five Ways to Avoid Food Waste, El Paso Manor Elementary School, Grisler Chicken, Florence Markhofer Elementary School, How to Make Boater Cup, Ellen Fiker Elementary School, How to Make Cornbread, Berry Hill Elementary and Middle School, How to Make Egg Fried Rice. El Paso Manor Elementary School. How to make Bulgula. C.W. Dillard Elementary School. How to make yummy homemade bread. Florence Markhofer Elementary School. How to use Silhouette. Del Paso Manor Elementary School. Mento and Soda Experiment. Del Paso Manor Elementary School. Mold Your Mind, Florence Markhofer Elementary School. Sand Dollar Crackers, Sunrise Elementary School. Spritz Cookies with Bread, Florence Markhofer Elementary School. In the grades seven through eight instruction category, the finalists are Five Ingredient Pasta, Lewis Pasture Fundamental Middle School, American Sign Language Tutorial, Samuel Jackman Middle School, Como Harser Tamales Verdes, Samuel Jackman Middle School, How to 3D Print, Lewis Pasture Fundamental Middle School, How to Draw a Halloween Cake Pop, Albert Einstein Middle School. How to make Japanese curry. Catherine L. Albiani Middle School. How to play basketball. John Barrett Middle School. How to play basketball for beginners. Gold River Discovery Center. How to play the piano 101. Catherine L. Albiani Middle School. How to read Roman numerals, Robert L. McCaffrey Middle School. How to repot a plant, Catherine L. Albiani Middle School. Italian soda made easy, Catherine L. Albiani Middle School. In the grades 9 through 12 instructional category, the finalists are Candy Caramel Apple Tutorial, Casa. Roble Fundamental High School, Graphic T Cordova High School, How to Clean Your Pool, Catherine L. Albiani Middle School, How to Do a Handstand, Galt High School, 
how to do a pull-up. We Americano High School. How to make a chocolate mud cake. Rio Americano High School. How to make a Neapolitan pizza. Cordova High School. How to make sushi. El Camino Fundamental High School. How to replenish your curls after straightening your hair. Rio Americano High School. How to write and publish a book. Intercom High School. Let's make a vase. Rosemont High School. Pipe Cleaner Flower Tutorial. Pleasant Grove High School. There you have it, the 2024 Student Educational Video Awards finalist. Don't forget, we have the big event coming up on Sunday, April 28th at Hiram Johnson High School. Be sure to RSVP online at the SECC website. We're looking forward to seeing you and your family at the unforgettable event, celebrating the 2024 SIVA Award. Stay tuned for each of the instructional videos in their entirety. We'll see you tomorrow at 5 p.m. with our PSA finalist right here on SECC Comcast 16. And you can stream and connect with us online at seccTV.org and by using the hashtag SIVA Awards. We'll see you tomorrow at 5 p.m. with our last category, the PSA Finalist. Choose whatever colors you'd like. Five. Put your beads on your string. to help. Step seven, give your bracelet to a friend. That's how you make a friendship bracelet. All right guys, so I'm gonna be teaching you how to pitch a baseball. First, a forcing fastball used when movement on the pitch is not needed. Next, circle changeup used when an off speed pitch is needed. Next, curveball used to strike out batters. And last, a chasing fastball used when movement is needed on pit. Now I'm gonna be teaching you how to get ready.
my name is Kyle Rogers, and I hope this helps you with pitching a baseball. to do. Charge your iPad at night by plugging it in. Go to your settings and turn on the power. Ding! While at school, turn on your airplane mode. This will conserve your battery. Yeah. First, put your lemons in warm water. Then, dry your lemons. Next, grate your ginger. After that, put it in a jar. Next, cut lemons into half. Next, take off the seeds. Next, squeeze the juice. Add honey and mix well. Chop the lemon peel. into the jar. Cover and put it in the fridge. Enjoy! I am Soya Kobabe and I want to show you how to make a cup of noodles. Before you do this at home, you should have parent permission or supervision. After you open it, you peel the lid off but only halfway. If you really don't like the veggies, you can just throw them in the trash. Next, you need hot water. I use a kettle. You have to fill it up halfway with water. Now we're gonna be boil the water. Have supervision by a adult or parent. Now we have to wait for the water to boil and we can play a game or do something else. When you see the steam, you can turn off the fire and put it in your cup and noodles bowl. 
Next, we're gonna open the kettle and pour the hot water into your cup of noodles until the noodles are covered. Be careful, it's hot. Next, you grab a fork and you close the lid and put the fork on so the steam can heat it up and you can wait for three minutes or a little longer. You can put a three minute timer to wait. While you're waiting for three minutes, you can do the same thing as last time or do something a little different. The timer just went off. Now it's time to enjoy it. You can dump out the broth if you want to. Enjoy. How to be a good big brother. There are a lot of ways that you can be a good big brother. Here are some. You can help your little brother do things like helping them put on their shoes. But if they need help from an adult, make sure you call an adult. Be sure to be gentle and patient when you help them. Another way to be a good big brother is to make their bottle so they can go to sleep too. Isn't it cute? What a way to be a good big brother is to love your little brother. Okay, so today we are going to do some SRC. So to do this, you are going to need to go to the portal which go to a new tab type in piano and um you pop up okay. um you'll pop up where you, it's set you need to click a button um and once you click that button then you go in and you gotta type in your username and password You'll put up here, here, H H H M H Sam Central. Come over here and signing in. You go to reading counts. You take a quiz. Type in anything. I'm just going to go Diary of a P Kid. I'm just going to do that. I spelled it wrong, so if you spell it wrong, it's probably not going to show up. Then do it by author. And if take take the SRC and answer questions correctly, and if you are a newbie, like a first grader, pig, the pug, 
are some great books for you. You take them, and you got to start by thinking, okay, so what is... You, go, you can look in the book or see if you memorized it. So this says, Pig said he would never share, play, steal, or lie. Once you finish it, it will tell you how much you got, how many things you did wrong. It will tell you how many, what's it? Ah, yes. How many questions you got right? You need at least 70% to pass. If you don't pass, you have to wait 24 hours before you can take it again. Then, if you want to see how many answers you have, you come over here. This is my personal amount. But that doesn't mean you make it here. If you get enough SRC points, you can make it to a party. My name is Jack and I'm going to show you how to make a s'more. First, we're going to get our ingredients. You'll need graham crackers, marshmallow, and my favorite are Reese's. Next, we're going to put the Reese's right here, marshmallow right there. We're going to put it in the microwave for 20 seconds. When 20 seconds is over, you're gonna take it out and then you're gonna grab your s'more. Thanks for watching. I'm Maverick. And I'm Phoenix. And we're, we're gonna, gonna show, show you how, how to make rubber band, band bracelets. Okay, so step one you grab one, one or two of these. So you put it on your finger like this, you twist it, put it on. Take another one, twist it, and put it on. And then you're gonna take that first one you put up, the bottom one, on, and pull it up, and repeat that as many times as you need. But just make sure it's long enough for either a bracelet or a necklace, because if it's too short, short, it's not gonna fit, and it's gonna feel really tight. One. You're gonna take this like that and put it on that finger. You're gonna hook it around two, just two, not all four. Two, like. So now you're gonna take the end. You're gonna wrap it one, around one of your fingers. So you're gonna go through one, and then there you go. You got yourself a bracelet. And here's what not to do. So don't put on weed and then twine it that way. Or else you just mess it up. And don't, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do like, only loop it twice and don't put like eight on there. You're gonna mess up the whole thing. Also, like if you got it like that, and you like try and do that you're not gonna get anywhere at all one dollar bracelet buy one get one free One dollar bracelet, buy one, get one free. Around 30% of food is wasted according to the FDA. This means all the resources that went into making that food are wasted too, which affects climate change. Here are five ways to avoid food waste. Number one, storing foods properly will help food last longer. Number two, 
don't buy more than needed. Number three, keep track of expiration dates so you can plan out your meals. Number four, don't buy things just because they look good. That is wasteful. Number five, share a meal with a friend to avoid overeating. Also, if food is wasted, it can be composted. By using these tips, you can help save water, reduce the speed of climate change, and help eliminate food insecurity. Today we will be making a delicious and scrumptious dinner called Grizzler Chicken. Can you tell us a little about Grizzler Chicken? Mm, Grizzler Chicken started from my father, uh, Great Papa Grizzler, and uh, he started it from a, a menu and then that he got in the mail. And from that, he ended up adding stuff to it. So as you learn to cook, you kind of spice it up with your own spices and, and extra stuff, okay? So it kind of went from a, a pop a grandfather to me, and I'm handing it down to you, okay? It's very important to wash your hands because then you can get all the germs back to you and you don't want the germs to get in your food. Yeah. And... Wait, I thing. just remembered. Go ahead. What's a duck's favorite snack? I don't know. Crackers. Crackers, very mm. good. Well, now that we've washed our hands, time to start opening the chicken. There you go. Okay, now that we've washed our chicken, see, nice and squeaky clean, time to put the, it in that. Now we use a whisk to mix it all up. Time to pour the Italian breadcrumbs. into four pieces. Count with me. One, two, three, and we have four pieces. Make sure you get it all over. Yep. What's next, Papa? The cooking line. The cooking one? And it's for cooking only. Oh, come on. Okay. I thought I was going to have some. Oops. Sprinkle it gently all over. So you have some. Yeah. There you go. Is that it? The oven is 350 degrees and the tin foil will be on the chicken for 30 minutes. We will take off the, the tin foil and put it back in and there won't be any tin foil on the chicken for 15 minutes. But that's the total of 45 minutes. Very good. How to put this in the oven? Hey, Papa, you think you can help me? Sure. Thank you. Okay, we'll put this here. There you go. Mm, time to try it, but first, let's talk about it. It smells good, looks good. Tastes good. You can try this with broccoli, rice, or noodles. Thank you for watching. Bye! <laughs>
I'm going to show you how to make a Dutch treat called Boterkoek. So you're going to need flour, sugar, almond paste, an egg, two sticks of butter, and a nine inch round cake pan. First things first, you're going to want to preheat the oven to 360 degrees. just normal almond paste. I took one cup of almond paste and I added three-fourths cup of sugar, one egg, and one teaspoon lemon extract. Next, soften your two sticks of butter in the mixer. And if there's butter left on the papers, save them because we'll use them later. You can turn the mixer up if you need to, to get the butter creamy. Now slowly add in one and one fourth cup of sugar. Next, slow down your mixer a little bit and crack your egg into the bowl. And don't forget to wash your hands after you crack it or have a parent crack the egg for you. After that, add in two cups of flour. Now add in two tablespoons of almond paste. Now shut off your mixer and don't forget to scrape all the dough off of the beater. After that, if you save the paper from your two sticks of butter, rub those on the nine inch cake pan to get some of the butter on it. If you didn't save them, take some butter and warm it up in your microwave for a little bit and rub that on the pan. After that, use a spatula to get the dough in the mixing bowl into your cake pan. Now get your fingers wet and pat down the dough so it fits in the pan, but make sure that your hands are clean. Now take milk or a beaten egg and brush it on the top of the Boterkoek. Now use an oven mitt or something to cover your hand so it doesn't get burned to put your Boterkoek into the oven. Now cook your Boterkoek for 30 to 35 minutes until golden color. After your Boterkoek is done, take it out of the oven. Let your Boterkoek cool completely before cutting it into rhombuses. Now enjoy your homemade Boterkoek. Thanks for watching. How to make cornbread.
add one cup of cornmeal, one cup of flour, one fourth cup sugar, one tablespoon salt, one large egg, and one fourth cup of cooking oil. Step one, turn the oven to 375 degrees. Step two, get a pan and a big bowl. Step three, grease the pan with butter. Step four, grab all the ingredients. Step five, put one egg in the bowl. Step six, put two thirds cup of milk in the bowl. Step seven, add one third cup of vegetable oil. Step eight, put the mixture into the bowl. Step nine, mix everything together. Step 10, put the mixture into the pan. Step 11, put the pan in the oven. Step 12, let it bake for 25 minutes. Step 13, take the pan out of the oven. Step 14, enjoy your cornbread. to make it easier to peel. Now that you are done peeling, we can start chopping. Salad, which is more like a flavor for onion. Chop off the ends. Now we peel off the skin. Get out the egg. You should use two egg and whisk it with a chopstick. The last thing we need to chop is the spring onion. 
chop off a bottom pot. Now we are ready to start cooking. For cooking, we like to use a wok and we use real gas stove. First step, coat the wok with oil. Then put in a spoonful of pork fat. Next, put in the garlic, the shallot, and the ginger. You can smell the wok hay, a very good aroma. Next, get the leftover rice. about four spoonful. After that, uh, get some soy sauce. Grab some sesame oil. Stir it in more. Do four shakes of ground white pepper. If you are not afraid of spice, use sambal hot sauce. And then the most important ingredient, the king of flavor, MSG. You can never, there can never be enough MSG. Put in about five spoonful of MSG into your egg fried rice. Two, three, five. Now turn off the heat. For garnish, put in spring onion. And that is how you make a proper Asian egg fried rice. Hi, my name is Samir Prasad, and I have a question for you. Do you know what Indians do on a rainy day like this? Well, they make snacks. Today we are going to be making an Indian snack called gulgula. It is soft on the inside and crunchy on the outside. So to make gulgula, you are going to need two cups of flour, 
two cups of water, half cup of sugar, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, two ripe bananas, and a big bowl. And for the bananas, you're going to need to mash them. And so now, let's get cooking. The first step is to mash the bananas. You are going to use a fork and mash them so there's no chunks at all. All right, now we are going to put the dry ingredients in. So first, we'll put the flour. And then we'll put the sugar. Now we'll mix the dry ingredients. bananas in. And then we will put one teaspoon of vanilla. And finally, we will pour the water. Now mix all the ingredients together. So now, this is how you're going to put the batter into the oil. So you're going to scoop it from the sides and make sure there's no drip. And then you're going to tightly squeeze into the oil, not too close and not too far. So scoop and then drop. Make sure it goes fast. Scoop and then drop. Keep stirring occasionally on medium heat for three to four minutes until it turns golden brown. Here is the finished gurgula. And now we're going to break it apart to see the fluffy inside. Looks good, right? Now we'll try it. Yum! Delicious! Thank you for watching. Bye. Today, I'm going to teach you how to make delicious homemade bread. I know what you're probably thinking. Why on earth make homemade bread when you can just go to the store and pick it up? Well, actually, making homemade bread has quite a few perks. One, it's only sweetened with honey, no sugar, and all that other stuff. And it includes whole grains. Plus, this bread has no unnecessary preservatives. This is why it is much more healthy compared to store-bought bread. First, we like to make our hard white wheat flour by grinding hard white wheat flour berries in the blender. Then, with my handy little sifter, I'll just sift them all into another bowl. This might get a little loud, so make sure to wear hearing protection before you start your blender. Now that we've finished blending, time to get to sifting. Now that we have all the ingredients set up, let's get started. First, we need to put in the warm water. Then, we've got to get started on that honey. Then, we've got the oats. Now, we've got the wheat we just ground. Then, we've got our flour.
Oh my gosh, I almost forgot. We've got the salt and the yeast. Then, of course, we have the yeast. You have to make a finger hole and then just put in the yeast into the finger hole. It's okay if it goes out a tiny bit. Now, we're gonna put it in the bread maker. The bread maker is already on the dough setting. You just have to lock it in place. And then, start it. Time for the fun part. The fun stand! What a doughy fun. So, I called in an expert, and today, she's gonna help shape our bread. So what you wanna do is you take it out of the pan, and it might be a little bit doughy, so you just wanna get a little bit of flour in your hands so that it doesn't stick. And then you'll want to get, make sure that you get the blending part of the bread machine out, the mixer, and then roll up your sleeves. I'm going to kind of just push the corners in and then roll, and then I'm going to cut it in half because this is going to make two loaves. I'm going to put a little bit of flour really? in Really? Two loaves? That's quite a bit. Yeah. And then, again, just add a little flour. And tuck the corners and roll. Tuck those corners and roll. And then I'm gonna just pinch to try to keep the dough, the loaf together. And it doesn't have to look perfect. It can be a little bit messy and still taste amazing. And then I'll put that here. And we'll do one more. All right. Wow, that's pretty amazing. You are quite the expert. All right, so then you just put it on there. And then you take your knife and it gives those pretty dough lines and it allows the bread to rise nicely. It might get hot while you're cooking, so make sure to wear these heat protection. The oven first should be set to 350 on Kim Beck Kim Bake. And here comes the boring part, cooking. You just have to wait so much time. for 25 minutes. Wait, that's it. That's it! Yes! We're done! Oh! Here comes the best part. You get to start digging in with some friends. Here's the bread. Let's eat it up. All right, some of it, so let's eat it. Mmm, so good. I know what you're thinking. Where's the bloopers? Now you can take your headphones off. What do I do? Now is the bestest of the best parts. It's time to dig in, and you can always invite friends over to enjoy eating. Here's the bread. Let's eat it. I already ate it, so. This is how to design a logo using the Silhouette Studio program. First you select an image, then trace it and select colors.
you then need to put it through the digitizing process using another program. I use Chroma. These are the colors and materials I chose. The machine can take up a lot of space considering its size and it comes with a wall mount. This is me putting on and cutting the tackle tool. After that, you hoop your clothing item and put it on the machine. Then center and trace it before starting. This is the heat press used to press vinyl, or in this case, tackle tool, to your clothing. You also need to put in the file using the tablet on the right side of the machine. Then let the needle run for the required amount of time for the item you chose. This is the needle stitching some of the letters out on the sweatshirt. This is the finished product after using the programs and starting the sweatshirt. Today we're going to be testing Diet Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, and Sprite with Mint Mentos to see which one makes the best explosion. But first, we asked family members, why do you think soda and Mentos react together? There's bubbles in soda, minerals in it, and chemicals and flavorings and all this stuff. Soda is acidic. Soda is bubbly. So maybe when you put the sparkle in the soda, it makes the soda bubbles just go crazy. So there's some kind of chemical reaction. There's probably some that releases a lot more gas. What do you think happens when you put Mentos and soda together? First up, we have Sprite. Next up, we have Dr. Pepper. Lastly, we have Diet Pepsi. Now let's we'll learn how Mentos and soda react together. The reason that soda and Mentos react together is because soda contains carbon dioxide, which makes it bubbly. Normally when you pour soda into a glass, you'll see foam rise to the top, but there is still some carbon dioxide trapped underneath the circuit surface, which is the bubbles. When, even though Mentos may seem smooth, they actually have dense and gaseous. If you look at them under a microscope, they are definitely not smooth. When you put the mento into the soda, the soda bubbles or carbon dioxide latch on to the mento, and the mento pushes them away, pushing them to the surface where you see the explosion. The best thing about this experiment, though, is that there's a tastiness of the afters. Cheers. Cheers. Mornings are a very important part of your day. And starting your morning in the wrong way can lead to you having a bad day. Minor setbacks unnecessarily become bigger issues. Oh, why won't it fit? Forget it, I don't even want to go to school. Oh, why can't I solve this math problem? What's wrong with me? In order to get your day started in the right way, you should use the first five to 10 minutes after waking up to do something that will uplift your mood. So here are three things you can do to get your day started the right way before you pick up that phone. Number one, greet your family members or pets. Hi dude, you're a good boy. Number two, move your body, whether it's walking around the house or stretching. And number three, Write down positive affirmations or things you are grateful for in a journal. Starting your day in a more positive way will help you mold your mind to deal with any obstacles that come your way. It 
helps you be more resilient and make good decisions. It's okay, I've got this. I can try using my notes for help. I hope this video has shown you ways to mold your mind and start your morning in a positive way. How to make sand dollar crackers. You will need cookie sheet, rolling pin, round cookie cutter, whisk, measuring cups and spoons, parchment paper, bowl, wooden skewer, basting brush, and cooling rack. And for your ingredients, flour, half and half, grated Parmesan cheese, salt, paprika, cord butter, and sliced almonds. Step one, set temperature to 400 degrees. Step two, wash your hands. Step three, mix together the dry ingredients. Add one and one fourth cups of flour. Then add one third cup of grated Parmesan cheese. Next, add one half teaspoon of paprika and one half teaspoon of salt. Then whisk together. Step four, add in the butter. Add three tablespoons of cold butter cut into small pea-sized pieces. Step five, pour in the half and half into your bowl. Pour in one half cup of half and half. Step six, whisk your ingredients together. Stir until dough pulls together. Step seven, lightly flour your area. Step eight, knead your dough a few times. Step nine, roll out your dough. Use a floured rolling pin to roll the dough very thin, about one eighth inch thick. Step 10, cut your dough into circles. With a round cookie cutter, about two inches to two and one fourth inches wide, cut out a bunch of circles from the dough. Step 11, poke holes in the middle of each circle. Put the parchment paper onto your tray. Then use a toothpick or skewer to poke holes in the middle of each circle. This helps keep the cracker flat when it bakes. Step 12, add five almond slices to each circle. 
Working with one cracker at a time, use your brush to spread a tiny bit of water on top. Then lightly press five almond slices into the dough around the hole to create a star shape. Step 13, bake for about six to seven minutes. Step 14, remove from oven and let them cool. Step 15, enjoy! Sand dollar crackers. Hi, my name is Jess and today we're making spritz cookies. It's one of the easiest cookies to make. First, you need two sticks of butter, softened, not melted. See, it has a type of form, not, it doesn't just go with and fill in the gaps. Then, we add three, four cups of sugar. Three fourths. Then, Mixing the sugar with the butter so it doesn't sound gritty and it's like smooth. Then you get the egg and you put it in. Mix that egg in really good. After you get all the egg mixed, you add the vanilla and the almond. One teaspoon of vanilla. One teaspoon of almond extract. Then you mix it in. Now I put two and a quarter cups of flour in. And then you mix it in. It will take some time to mix this. After you mix all the flour in, I'd recommend a bigger bowl because this was hard with all the tiny bowl. Now that the dough is mixed, I'll fill this container. Yes. To get it to go down, I use this. You stick this in all the way down and line them up. You take this and screw this on. Fun fact, this has been long for a long time. This was my great grandma's, so spritz cookies, they've been here for a long time. There we go. After that, take this off and put your stencil on. I picked the doggy. doggy. There's other things too, but I would pick the doggy and put it on my stencil. And after you do that, you plug it in. Some spritz cookies are manual, but this one's electric with a button. Let's see how fast this can make. Look how fast I'm making these cookies. Look at all these doggies. Now I'm going to put 
put them in the oven. Pick at 400 degrees and have a parent help you with the oven. Now we set timer for eight minutes. Alexa, set timer for eight minutes. Eight minutes, starting now. While those are book baking, I'm gonna make some different ones. Let's take this off. Instead, I'm gonna make some flowers. Do it. I hope okay. And done. Okay. Why not one more? Ooh, the timer went off. They're just turning slightly brown. They're well done. They're also delicious. Since all my delicious doggies are done and on the rack, I'm going to make some hearts while the other ones are cooking. These ones are flowers and they look delicious. I'm gonna make some different types. They look like windmills, so let's see what the dinner ought to be. I ran out. Wow, look at all these cookies. And we, I've already ate a number of them. I'll take these to the enemy's crew. sharing cookies. It's like sharing happiness. I like sharing cookies with my friends, especially when I have a lot. And spritz cookies makes a lot. I got I got you. You. You got you. Hi, I'm Sienna, and in today's video, I'm going to be teaching you how to make zucchini noodle pasta, or as my family likes to call it, oodles of zoodle noodles. I really love calling it that. I have no clue how we came up with that. I think we just added to it over the years, but it makes me laugh every time I say it. A nice thing about this dish is it only takes five basic ingredients. They're really easy to find and they're really affordable. Another nice thing about this dish is it only takes 20 to 30 minutes to make and if you made it a couple times, I bet you could do it even faster. Now let me tell you, this dish is a crowd pleaser. I myself know a lot of picky eaters and every one of them that I fed this to have loved it. They've asked me for the recipe and they've made it themselves at home because it's so easy. And I don't want to hear, well, this video isn't for me because I don't know how to cook. Because cooking is just as easy as picking up a recipe and following directions. But if that still sounds intimidating, then this recipe is definitely for you. Because I did not follow one direction while making this. I just looked at it, said, yep, that looks good. Added as much as I wanted and called it a day. And it still tasted amazing. Now, it's a fact that everything tastes better with bacon, and especially this dish. A topping that I love to add is bacon bits because it just adds a flavor that nothing else can beat. 
I want to thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye. Hi, um, my name G-I-U-L-I-A-N-A, -I -I Juliana, welcome everyone. My name, L-O-B-E-B-A-N-D-E-R, come sign together. Conversation. So how to say hi in sign language is put your hand into a beat and you put it on your forehead. You said hi. 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 Or if you want to say what's up, you can put your middle finger up to your chest and say what's up. What's up? And that's how you say hi and what's up. Um, I am going to teach you how to say how are you. Um, how how are you? Um Sign language has its own grammar and language, so there are many different ways on how to say how are you. My name, my name, make sure to type it two times. My name, G I U L I A N A. How to uh, do emotions. So, I'm good. Um, I'm tired. This is how to say you too. Put your pointer finger and then you too. I will teach you how to have, I mean how to say have a nice day. Have a nice day. Nice to meet you. I'm gonna teach you how to say please sign slowly, which is how to say please is your palm of your hand, your palm of your hand, of your dominant hand, up to your chest and rub it in circles. Please. And then how to do sign is you put your two pointing fingers up and uh, move towards your chest, like inwards. Sign. So it's please, sign. And then slowly is you put your non dominant arm out and your dominant hand and put it on your hand. Where are you from in sign language? And that is you from where? From is your dominant hand onto your non dominant and like this. From. From. Where? Where? So it goes you from where? I'm learning sign. Okay, ready? I'm pointing to yourself. Dominant hand is mostly gonna do all the moves. And we do. I'm learning. Your hands are like a book. Dominant hand on top, and you put the words in your mind. Sign is like like we learned before. Is your two pointed fingers and fingers. Gracias, González. Y hoy les voy a enseñar cómo hacer las tamales verdes. Ven acá. 
Antes que comenzamos, primero vamos a poner las hojas en la vaporola con agua caliente para que se remojen, para que se ponen blanditas. Los ingredientes que vamos a necesitar es un kilo y más una taza de harina para tamales, sal, 500 gramos de manteca de puerco, vamos a necesitar pechuga de pollo, caldo de pollo, royal, ajo, cebolla, cilantro, tomatillos y jalapeños. Para el relleno, aquí ya tenemos los ingredientes que están aquí. Son tomatillos, jalapeño y un ajo y cilantro. También aquí tenemos la cebolla y ajo que la vamos a poner. Al lado también tenemos la vamos a regalar un agua. con aceite. Este paso lo voy a pasar a mi mamá porque luego me va a quemar. Aquí mi mamá va a echar un poco de agua ahí para que se quite todo lo que falta ahí y que la echa ahí. Vamos a dejar que hierve por unas 5 minutos. Ahora con nuestras manos limpias para preparar la masa, vamos a ocupar media taza de hielo y la manteca. Ahora le voy a dejar este paso a hacer mi mamá porque yo no sé cómo. Aquí mi mamá está echando la manteca arriba de los hielos y la va a meñar hasta que se deshace la hielo y luego vamos a echar la harina. Y con la harina la vamos a echar se echa poco, a poco. poco a poco. Con taza la lleno todo. Uh -huh. Se llena toda la taza. Y se echa poco a poco. Aquí le falta el caldo para empezar a hacer la masa después que ya se revolvió toda la manteca. Ahora tú vas a echar poco a poco, no echas todo a un vez, porque luego no vas a saber si está bien o no. Se 
En este momento, vamos a echarle la sal y la polvo para hornear. O sea, aquí tenemos la polvo, la vamos a tapar y vamos a agarrar un cucharada y la echamos en la tama, el, el harina y Mismo con la sal. Y ahora para el verbo ver. Vamos a comenzar a amasar. Aquí se ve que se falta caldo. Yo. Aquí se mira como se falta es caldo. En este paso mi papá se está probando la masa. ¿Cómo cuenta el chavo? Ustedes también se pueden probar la, la masa para que saben que cuánto sal le falta, mucho o bien poco. Ahora echamos más caldo. No quieres echar mucho caldo porque luego se va a poner muy aguado y luego no se va a poder formar tanto la tamal. ¿Cómo te necesitas sentir para que, se, para que ya no eches la caldo? Tiene que quedar más aguadita, como si fuera el arroz. Ah, entonces se puede mirar como el arroz, se puede pulir. Entonces, ¿qué además? Sí. Entonces, ¿qué más? Sí. Como solo mezclando, ahorita tenemos una, tenemos agua ahí, tenemos agua ahí y mi mamá agarra un poquito de la masa y la echa ahí para saber si se flota está bien, si no siguen mezclando. Vamos a poner a escurrir las hojas. Uh -huh. Primero la enjuagas y luego la escuras. Uh -huh. Ahorita no se, no se mira, pero allí al lado tiene un, mi mamá un traste que tiene hoyos y que está echando la, las hojas para que se escuren.
para. Si ya tienes todos tus hojas oscuridos, agarra un trapo y saca, sácalos. No puedes separar con cuáles que vas a usar para las malas y para cuáles vas a qué. Si las malas puedes separar para, para qué. Para poner en la olla. Para puedes poner las ollas. No tienes las malas, nomás dejarlos ahí para que luego la pones en la olla. La, 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 la vaporera o la olla? La vaporera. ¿La vas a poner la vaporera o la, la olla? Las hojas malas se las ponen en la vaporera. O sea, tu papá ya está poniendo a calentar el agua para que no se tome. Mientras que mi mamá está secando las hojas y separando, la voy, la, voy, la voy a traer la cámara acá a mi papá. Aquí. ¿Mi papá está llenando la agua con, con media, media alta o qué? No, está llenando este, este, esta taza, este... Esta taza con... Recipiente para echarle agua a la vaporera. Esta línea la vas a ocupar al... Esta esta línea tiene este que estar. Y la ponemos a... Ya que hierva, caliente. Uh -huh. En lo que tu mamá hace... Aventaja uh -huh. Yo creo que con este no es suficiente. ¿Eso se mira bien? Sí, aquí está la tapa, la tapa, la no la tapa, la parte. Abajo, ahí está el nivel. Uh -huh. si, si se llena un poquito, eso es, eso es ok. No, no si, se, si se llena como un poco, mucho, luego se la quita y luego se, se quita la agua poco a poco. Las, las hojas que malas que tu mamá está separando, uh -huh. esas son las que se ponen abajo. ¿Y para qué se hacen así? Para que no pase el agua para los tamales y se mojen. Uh -huh. Se ponen más abajo. Después se ponen los tamales y arriba se le ponen hojas también para que haga el vapor. Uh -huh. Ahora regresamos con mi mamá. Oh, de verdad, con la, con la pechuga van a ocupar a, a ¿cómo? desmenuzarla. Y si la puedes echar la salsa en la bote que está ahí, la pechuga, o puedes echar la pechuga dentro de la salsa. ¿Cuál sea que, te, que, que quieres? sea más mejor para ustedes ¿Sí? y ahí ya tenemos el, el pollo con su salsa el relleno el relleno para los tamales uh -huh. ahora regresamos con mi mamá el relleno ya está Y nosotros llegamos a las hojas y nomás aquí se han echado las y las están parando suficiente para que se vean con la relleno y que se puede cerrar. Es verdad. Thank you.
Ahora se está haciendo. Voy a poner las hojas. Y así se hacen hasta más veces. I'm Henry and today I'm going to teach you how to 3D print. There are many different types of 3D printers you can use, but today I'll be using my toy box. If you're using a toy box, let's head on over to their website. You can access it from your phone or a computer, but today I'll be demonstrating from my phone. They have a bunch of wonderful models to choose from, but today I think I'll print this cute lizard. First, we must make sure that the printer is turned on. Then let's click on the food button and make sure we have the color printer food we want to print with. If you don't, then you can simply tap the remove button and insert the color of your choice. I suggest tapping the insert button until you can clearly see the new color coming out of the nozzle. Now it's time to print. Let's click the button that says print me and wait patiently until it's done. Let's learn some helpful tips while we wait. The first tip I'm going to teach you is how to perform a color change. If you want your model to be multicolored, you can simply perform a color change by cutting the printer food and slowly inserting your new color into the hole. Color changes can make for a very unique addition to any model, and if you can print it one color, then why not print it two? What if you could design your own creations? Yep, that's right. Using a helpful website called Tinkercad, I'm going to teach you how to invent your own 3D printable models. I recommend Tinkercad, but there are many other websites that will allow you to make your very own creations. I 
I like using Tinkercad because it's super simple. There are already a bunch of prepared shapes and objects you can reform to your liking or use to create a huge masterpiece. It also makes it easy to download the file and import it into Toybox or whatever 3D printer you're using and turn it into a real toy. Some websites might allow you to even submit your own models for other people to print. This can make for a nice pastime while our lizard finishes printing. And right about now our lizard should be done printing. Let's go see how it looks. Wow, this lizard turned out great. I love how the legs are a different color from the body, so let's make sure to give it a smiley face. Don't forget to turn off the printer! And that's just about it. I love to incorporate 3D printing into my everyday life, and it's such a wonderful hobby. I hope this video helped, and happy printing! Hi guys, it's Emily, and I'm going to be showing you guys how to draw a Halloween cake pop. Materials you'll need to draw this Halloween K-pop are colored pencils, a marker, and a stencil if you have one. Step one of drawing your Halloween K-pop is you're going to need to draw a perfect circle. Step two, after you're done drawing your perfect circle, you're going to draw two lines going towards you as the stick. Now draw your drips for the frosting. Step four. Now you're going to draw the eyes for your Halloween cake pop. You're gonna draw two upside down triangles. Now you're going to draw the mouth of your Halloween K-pop. For this, you're going to use a pencil. Now, to draw your mouth, you're going to start from one of the eyes and draw one kind of U-shape through. And you're going to draw a big U under. Just like that. Now you're going to draw the mouth and teeth. So first you're going to start from one corner and trace over a little bit, but you're only gonna go a little bit. And then you're gonna draw one tooth going down and then going back up to that line. Then you're going to go again and then draw the second tooth, just like that. After that, you're going to go back to this part, go all the way back down, and then in the middle, you're going to go up and then back down, just like that. Now your pencil lines that you see, you're going to erase them. Just like that. Make sure that there's no pencil lines left to make it look pretty. We're almost done with the Halloween cake pop. Now onto my favorite step, coloring. You can either use colored pencils or markers. Now time to fast forward. I'm going to color it the way I want to, but you can color it any way. Hope you guys had fun following along and liked how your K-pop turned out. See you guys next time, bye! Hey, 
Are you craving a warm, hearty, savory meal? I've got just something for you, Japanese curry. I'm your host, Elizabeth Nguyen, and I'm gonna show you how to make this simple, comforting dish. For this recipe, you will need two yellow onions, two medium-sized carrots, 15 ounces of Yukon gold potatoes, one and a half pounds of chuck roast, four cups chicken or veggie broth, one small knob of ginger, two cloves of garlic, salt and pepper, and the most important ingredient of all, curry blocks. This can be found at your local grocery store's Asian section. Optionally, you can add the ingredients on screen now. Wash, peel, and slice your carrots, onions, and potatoes into bite-sized pieces. Cut your meat into bite-sized pieces and add it to a bowl. Dice your garlic and ginger and add it to your meat. Salt and pepper to the meat and mix. If you're adding mushrooms, then they slice them. Stir fry your onions and mushrooms until fragrant. Add your beef and stir fry until it's lightly browned. Add your carrots and potatoes. Add your broth. Simmer for 15 minutes. Skim off any scum that floats to the top. You may now add your optional ingredients. Simmer until potatoes and carrots are tender and easy to pierce. Add your desired amount of curry blocks. I recommend using four to six as it determines the texture and flavor. Serve warm with rice and enjoy. Dinner is served. how to do basketball but first we need to know the rules and setup in basketball there are five people on the court from each team there's a center two wings and two guards the game starts with a jump ball the two centers from each team stand in the middle of the court the ref throws the ball up and the centers from each team jump for the ball and try and tip it on their side whatever team has the ball starts dribbling to the opposing side of the court there's a three-point line. Any shot made in behind the three-point line is three points. Any shot made inside of the three-point line, though, is only two points. If a foul happens, then you get two shots at the free throw line. Each shot made at the free throw line is only one point. There are four quarters in a basketball game, and each quarter is 12 minutes long. Now that you know the rules and setup, here's how to do shots, layups, and dribbling. The basics of shooting is getting your feet set in the position you like and holding the ball in the correct form. To hold the ball in the correct form, your leading hand, aka your primary hand, goes right at the base of the ball, like this. Your other hand lays on the side of the ball and makes sure the ball goes straight when you push it. Elbows in, push the ball in an arc, and watch it go right in. A simple layup is where you run up to the side of the hoop while dribbling the ball. Get the ball up and you shoot at the side of the square on the backboard and watch it go right in. How to dribble is easy. First, squat down, but not too down, when you're dribbling. You kind of absorb the bounce with the palm of your hand and push it back down. You can't slap, punch, or kick the ball or else it is a foul. Remember, not to always pull up and shoot threes or else the only position you will be playing is left bench. Also, try and put some pizzazz on your layups from time to time. To start, you will need to know the basics like dribbling, shooting, and defense. To dribble, push down the ball, spreading all five fingers. Don't push down hard, light pressure is enough. Also, keep your legs flexed and your back straight. Mm. 
when you shoot, first bend your knees and palm the ball, making sure there's in a gap between the palm and your ball. Put your other hand on the side of the ball. When you shoot a jump shot, shoot the ball on the way up, not on the way down or at the apex of your jump. To defend, you want to maintain your balance and be a little less than arm's length away from the ball carrier, creating pressure. When defending, make sure you're sliding your feet, not crossing them. Thank you for watching. We hope that we succeeded in teaching you the basics of basketball. They say happiness is pretty simple. Someone to love, something to do, something to look forward to. And well, mine is piano. Hello friends, my name is Sharon Gachula. I would like to show you how to play the piano in eight easy steps. In this video, you'll learn about the alphabet, notes, fingering, chords, arpeggios, and songs. Before you start your piano lessons, I want you to grab some post notes and stickers to put on your keyboard, like this. Step one, learn the layout of the piano keyboard. The alphabet goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G. After G, it goes on again until it ends on C. Notes are always in the same place in relation to the set of black notes. Every A is between the top two black notes in the set of three, and so on. Step two, start to play piano with your right hand. You should have one on C, two on D, three on E, four on F, and five on G. Now to play your first song, play the following finger numbers. Whenever there's a dash line next to a number, hold the note a bit longer. Three, two, one, two, three, 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 two, 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 two three, five, five, three, two, one, two, three, 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 two, two, three, two. Pause this video and practice. Step three, practice playing piano with your left hand. To learn piano properly, you want to play with both hands. Place your left pinky on the C low middle, eight notes lower. You should have five on C, four on D, three on E, two on F, and one on G. Now try playing these figure numbers. Three, four, five, four, three, 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 four, 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 three, one, one, three, four, five, four, three, 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 four, four, three, four, five. Step four, play piano with both hands. Now play the same song with two hands, each hand in the same position you just practice. Step five, learn how to play piano chords. Chords are three or more notes played together at the same time. Knowing how to play piano chords is one of the most essential piano skills for beginners. For example, if you wanted to play a C chord, you start by playing C. Now skip over the next note, D, and play E. So C, E. Then skip over the next note, F, and play G. So it would be C, E, G. Step six, start learning a piano song with chords. Let's take the song, Mary Had a Little Lamb. The first four chords are C, C, G, C. The first word of the song, Mary, comes at the same time when you play your first chord. Step seven, play the tune. Play the tune, or just a few notes of it to guide you as you sing. Singing will help you guide through the notes because you'll know what sound you're saying in your song. This depends on how good your musical instincts are. on five lines and the note heads alternate with the line going through the middle of them or sitting in between the lines. 
It's easier to learn the lines and spaces separately. When working out what letter the note is, just use A, C, E for the space notes and E for the line notes. Now that you learned each step, put them all together and you've learned the basics of piano. If you think you have the basics of piano figured out, start expanding the repertoire of songs and musical styles. Thanks for watching and welcome to the world of piano. So you know Roman numerals, right? Roman numerals are a number system that was used in ancient Rome. They are still used today in some places such as on clocks and sometimes even in movie credits. In this video we will learn how to read Roman numerals up to 15. Roman numerals are made of seven basic symbols. The I which represents one, the V which represents five, the X, which represents 10, the L, which represents 50, the C, which represents 100, the D, which represents 500, and the M, which represents 1000. To read Roman numerals, we need to understand a few rules. Symbols are read from left to right, and the value of each symbol is added together. If a smaller symbol appears before a larger symbol, we subtract the value of the smaller symbol from the larger symbol. If a smaller symbol appears after a larger symbol, we add the value of the smaller symbol to the larger symbol. Let's take a look at some examples. III 1 plus 1 plus 1 IV 5 minus 1 IX 10 minus 1 XIV 10 plus 5 minus 1. Great job! You now know how to read Roman numerals up to 15. Keep practicing and soon you'll even be able to read even larger numbers in Roman numerals. My name is Alyssa Hertz, and today I'm going to show you how to repot your plant in just 7 easy steps. Repotting your plants when needed is important because it helps keep your plants strong and healthy. First, you need to get all of your supplies. You will need gloves. I recommend gloves that are specifically for gardening. A shovel. Potting soil. A bigger pot and a plant. First, get your bigger pot. Take your new pot and fill it with potting soil. Leave two to three inches between the top of the soil and the edge of the pot. Use your old pot to make an indent in the soil. This is how big your hole will need to be. Use the shovel to make a hole in the soil the same size as the indent from the other pot. Next, gently place the stem of the plant in between your thumb and pointer finger. Turn the pot upside down and carefully pull out the plant. Place the plant in the hole in the soil. Use some more potting soil to fill in the gaps around the plant. Make sure there are no air pockets in the soil. Pack it down gently with your hands. Then you need to moisten the soil. Get some water, but don't add too much. I hope this tutorial has helped you learn how to repot a plant. Some helpful tips to remember when repotting a plant are 
that you don't need to fertilize your plant for about a month after repotting it because the potting soil already has a lot of fertilizer in it. And your plant may look a little wilted after repotting, but your plant is still healthy. It is just trying to get used to its new home. and this is how to make an Italian soda with your own ingredients. Any drink combo can be made with any soda or syrups you want to add. For this, we're going to need one can of Fresca, mango syrup, passion fruit syrup, coconut syrup, an orange slice, and a knife. The first step in making our soda is to pour the drink of choice in a cup. Today, we're going to be using Fresca, which is a grapefruit flavored soda. Next, you're going to want to pour the flavors in the soda. For this recipe, we'll be using mango, passion fruit, and coconut. One pump of each flavor will work, but the coconut has a stronger flavor, so we'll pour in just one tablespoon. But you can add just as much or as little as you want. Great. Now to make this look even better, we can add an orange to the drink for a little more zest. Make sure to be safe when cutting your little orange. We're almost finished. Good job. All the ingredients together, the syrup, the orange juice, all of it. Now that we've added all the flavors we need, all we need is a little bit of ice for a nice, cool treat. Enjoy it with friends and family for fun. Enjoy! Here's how to make a candy caramel apple. Ingredients. You're going to need a candy of your choice, caramel, corn syrup, cooking spray, food dye, sugar, parchment paper. Preparations. Cover your pan in parchment paper and spray generously with cooking spray. Wash your apples and twist the stem off. Stab the stick into your apple. Cooking. Add 3 fourths cup of water. Add 1 fourth cup of corn syrup. Add 2 cups of granulated sugar. Mix your ingredients together and bring it all to a boil. Once it's boiling, add your food dye and let it boil. Take it off the heat and coat your apples with the sugar mixture. Coat them in your caramel. Press the candy of your choice in the caramel. And voila, you got your candy caramel apple. Enjoy. Welcome to how to make your own graphic t-shirt. Things you'll need. Cricut machine, Cricut template, plain t-shirt, iPad to extract images and vinyl as well. Scissors as well. Then you want to upload your image to Cricut Space Design. Then choose how big or small you would want your image. Then you'll need scissor brand vinyl and scissors. Then cut the vinyl to the size of the template. Next, place the vinyl onto the template and turn the Cricut machine on. Press down lightly so vinyl is secured. Now let the Cricut machine do its thing. Next, remove the template and the vinyl. 
Then make sure you are able to see your design and peel off slowly. Next, you'll use the Cricut tool to peel the background of your image. Then you'll be left with the main design. Next, preheat the Cricut machine to 270. Next, place your shirt onto a flat surface. Next, center your image onto your shirt. Then gently press down so the adhesive can stick. Next, take your heat press and apply for 15 seconds. You would need to go in a rotation of a square to get each corner. Next, let it cool down and gently peel the plastic off. Finally, you have created your graphic tee. Now you are able to wear it and create outfits. Now show off your fashion sense to the world with your new graphic tee. on the surface of the water using a net like this. I recommend netting around the outside of your pool in lap-like circles, and then when you're done with that, and you empty your tapes and putting them into your greenway stand. The third step is gonna to be to brush off any leaves or allergy on your steps. When brushing your steps, you want to get all the leaves and algae off. When you brush the leaves off, make sure to get them off your steps and into the rest of your pool so that it's easier to get with your net. The fourth step is to take a very tall, tall, tall net and to scoop up all of the leaves on the bottom of your pool. When you clean the bottom of your pool, you will first want to go off the edge of your pool in order to get the big chunks of leaf. After that, you will want to go around your pool in order to get small groups of leaves. And then finish it off by getting all the ones in the middle that you missed. And if they start to float in the water, then you can wait for them to fall back down. And then you can pick them up with your net. And putting them into your green waste. Yeah. To add chlorine. First, you will want to turn off your pump if it is on. Now, you will clean out the skimmer by grabbing the leaves and putting them into your green waste can. Then, you will want to turn on your pump. As you add chlorine, you will want to walk around your pool as you spill it out of the bottle in order to spread it out across your pool. The amount of chlorine that you put in your pool will vary because of factors like how many gallons your pool has and what season it is. After around three hours time, you can turn your pump back off. Well, I guess I'll give it a try. This is a handstand, and in this video, I'm going to teach you how to do one, how to do one well, and some tips and tricks to help you look good doing it, too. Hi, I'm Ella. A handstand is a really easy, fun skill 
that helps you with body control, balance, self-awareness, and flexibility. It is also just a really cool skill to show off to your friends. When doing a handstand, you will want to wear flexible clothing and you will want to put your hair up and out of your face. You will need a wall or strong support in the beginning to hold you up. Also, for your safety, please do this over grass or a mat. Let's get into it. First, you will practice putting your hands on the ground while lifting your back leg into the air. After you have that down, you will practice lifting your back leg and jumping your front a little more off the ground at a time. Now it is time to start your lunge. Place your good leg in front, your bad leg in the back, holding your arms next to your head and covering your ears. The next step is to lower your hands and lift your back leg simultaneously while trying to keep a straight line. This is called a lever. Try this until you feel comfortable making a T-shape, then eventually going all the way to the ground with your hands. Now you are going to combine your previous steps. Start in a lunge, then lever your hands onto the ground and your bad foot into the air. Once your hands are on the ground, you will jump your good foot off the ground. Practice getting higher and higher into the air with both legs. Next is the wall. You will kick up hard enough to lean against your support. Hold it against the wall as long as you can, gaining strength and familiarity with each try. Gradually ease your weight away from the wall and hold it on your own. Continue this until comfortable with holding it straight up. One more thing to consider is that you might tip over when not next to a wall. You need to one, practice on a soft surface, and two, when that happens, know what to do. These next few tips should help. One method to save you from hitting the ground hard is to roll out of your handstand. You do this by bending your arms, tucking your head, rounding your back, and tucking your legs. Or for more flexible individuals, you can fall into a bridge by arching your back and bending your legs till your feet hit the ground, making a rainbow. You would then bend your legs and arms to come down. Please practice your bridge before trying to do it straight from the fall. To prevent coming down backwards, Work on your balance when straight up. Using your hands to adjust where your weight is can help. You can do this by either using the tips of your fingers to press harder against the ground to avoid going backwards, or using your palm in the same way. Some important details in your handstand are your hand placement, core, head, legs, and feet. You want your body to be a straight vertical line. First, your hands are going to be flat on the ground, your wrists at a 90 degree angle, and your arms straight above your head, or in this case, below your head. I find it easier to look at your hands so your chin is up and you are looking at the ground. You can also look straight ahead. You will want to squeeze your core and glute muscles so you are tight. Finally, your legs should be straight and please point your toes. Now that you've learned your handstand, make it your own. Practice holding it for a long time, doing fancy tricks, or even walking back and forth. I hope this video has benefited you, and remember to always be flexible. Have you ever wanted to do a pull-up, but never been able to? No worries, I'll show you what you need to do to be able to do a pull-up. To start off, you should exercise the muscles responsible for performing the exercise. You can do this through exercises such as a lat pull-down and rows. Your primary focus should be on your upper back muscles. The best exercise I have found is a reverse pull-up. Essentially, all you do is either use the momentum from a jump or use something to get to the top of a pull-up movement and hold for as long as you possibly can, not letting yourself fail the form of a pull-up. This recreates the motion of pull-up, which will help you strengthen your back muscles. It is also important to note that in each workout session, you should be pushing yourself a little bit more than the last workout, whether it's doing one more repetition or holding the pull-up bar for a couple of seconds longer. The second factor is your diet. You should focus on eating roughly one gram of protein per pound of body weight. For example, I weigh 155 pounds, so I should try to get at least 155 grams of protein. Protein will help your muscles recover, strengthening your body. 
Protein can be found in a plethora of foods such as chicken, nuts, eggs, protein powders, etc. The third factor is sleep. Sleeping is where strength is really built, as when you sleep, your body is able to rest and strengthen itself. You should aim for a minimum of 8 to 9 hours per night. If you combine all of these factors and put in an effort, you'll be able to do a pull-up. This isn't an overnight process, however, you must remain diligent and determined. It took me around one and a half months of training to be able to do a pull-up. It may take some time and struggle, but everyone can do it. How to make a chocolate mug cake. First, get your mug. Here's what you'll need. Milk, canola oil, vanilla extract, baking soda, unsweetened cocoa powder, salt, white sugar, all-purpose flour, and water. Add a fourth a cup of all-purpose flour and a fourth a cup of white sugar to your mug. Add two tablespoons of unsweetened cocoa powder, one eighth a teaspoon of baking soda, one eighth a teaspoon of salt, and mix. Add three tablespoons of milk, two tablespoons of canola oil, one tablespoon of water, and a fourth of a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Mix this again. Put this in the microwave uncovered for a minute and 45 seconds. Once it is done, you are ready to enjoy. You may add frosting or whipped cream. How to make a Neapolitan pizza. What you will need. You need a peel, the cooling tray, cutting board, a scraper, the tomato sauce, and the flour and dough. The ingredients you'll need is basil, mozzarella ovelline, parmigiano reggiano. The temperature should reach a maximum of 680 while cooking. Step one, stretch the dough. As you can see, we have our dough packaged and cased. The dough may be sticky, so flouring the dough makes it easier to take out. When you have your dough ready to use, you want to flour your dough as much as possible, but not too much or else it'll leave a little cardboard taste. Now there's a couple techniques when it comes to stretching pizza. One technique I like to call is the slap technique. You stretch the pizza like so with one hand and you slap it down with your dominant hand. Another technique is the knuckle technique. This technique has the help of gravity to help stretch the pizza. You wanna stretch the pizza with your knuckles but not too much because Neapolitan pizza dough is very, very fragile and soft. Step two, topping the pizza. Now, you want to use some fresh tomato sauce, swirl it around like so. For Neapolitan pizza, you want to leave a little bit of tomato sauce on the crust. Now this gives it a really, really amazing color. And then you want to top the tomato base with a little bit of Parmigiano Reggiano. After that, you take little bits of pizzas of mozzarella ovelline and spread it around the pizza like so. It doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be in circles, as long as it tastes good. Now you want to also throw in some basil. Now the margarita pizza cannot be complete without basil. As you see, the ingredients are colored like the Italian flag, red, white, and green. And then to finish it off, you want to put a drizzle of olive oil. Step three, transfer the pizza to the oven. You want to flour the peel as much as possible so that way the pizza doesn't stick to the peel. And once your pizza is on the peel, you can stretch it and shape it and form it however you like. Step four, firing the pizza. Now this step is the hardest step because most of the time the pizza takes this in a bad way, but it's okay, the pizza will find another job in the future. Now after about 30 to 45 seconds, you wanna lift the pizza up just a little bit to see if the crust is forming on the bottom, to see if it's charring a little bit. And then you wanna turn it like so, making sure all of the edges get cooked to perfection. And now once you see the cheese bubbling and the cheese browning and the crust starting to form and char, you know that the pizza is ready. Mwah! This pizza looks amazing. Let's take it to the cooling rack. Step five, top and cut the pizza. When you move the pizza to the cooling rack, 
you want to top it off with any other ingredients that you would like to add. For me, I'd like to add a little bit extra basil. And then cut the pizza. You want to move your hand down on the crust and just go in a straightforward motion, like so. And as you see here, when I push down on the crust, it rises back up perfectly. That is how you make Neapolitan pizza. Buon appetito, arrivederci. Hello everyone, my name is Ella, and today I'm gonna to be showing you how to make authentic sushi from the comfort of your own home. Today we are gonna be making a shrimp tempura roll. Today I'm making sushi because sushi is my favorite food and I'm also a part Japanese, so I wanted to connect more with my Japanese heritage. So let's get started. Some ingredients you'll need are two cups of water, three tablespoons of sugar, one and a half teaspoons of salt, and one third cup of rice vinegar. Two cups of Japanese short grain rice, pre-cooked tempura shrimp. You are also going to need an avocado, a cucumber, and sushi nori sheets. You can find these at the grocery store. Something I learned from my mom is that you should always wash your rice before you cook it because there are a bunch of starches in here and we don't want that in our roll. To wash your rice, all you're going to need to do is get a strainer and put your rice in it and run it under the faucet and kind of just sift through the rice with your fingers to make sure all of the grains of rice are washed. I also forgot to say that you need to get out your handy dandy rice cooker. Um, this is pretty old, you don't need anything new, just something to cook your rice with and you're gonna pour it in. And you're also going to pour in your two cups of water. And now you're just going to close the lid and turn the switch on to cook. There's no specific time it'll take you just have to watch it and then it'll click and then you'll open it and it'll be done. We're going to let that cook for a little bit and then we're going to cut up our veggies. This roll that I'm making is a roll I would have all the time as a child because I was not a raw fish lover and I was kind of picky so we would do tempura shrimp instead. You're gonna slice it all the way around. And it should look like this. Now we're just going to make slices like so into the avocado. So that later when we make the roll, you can lay them down and it'll look nice. We only have to do one half because we're not making that much. So next is the cucumber. You're going to want to cut off the edges because we don't want that in our bowl. And it just gives it a cleaner look in the end. I'm going to cut it in half one time. And then cut this in half. Again, we're not making that much. So we can put this to the side and we're going to cut it again. Halves on both. And half again. We want them to be really thin with all the other ingredients that we're putting in there. mixture for our rice. Um, you need one third cup of rice vinegar, 
three tablespoons of sugar and one and a half teaspoons of salt. And we're all gonna mix it in this vinegar and let it dissolve. And we're just gonna stir it till it dissolves. Now that our rice is done, we are going to pour, first, take your spatula, kind of separate the grains a little. And we're gonna let this sit for a little bit to cool off before we add our vinegar mixture. Now that our rice has cooled off, we're going to add our vinegar mixture into it. And we're just going to stir it around, make sure it's covering the rice, and then it gets absorbed. or your sushi mat and you're going to lay down a sheet of nori down and we are going to get some rice and create a thin layer on top of the nori and then after that we'll be adding in all of our ingredients then the roll will be too big and it won't close at the ends. You're gonna take your pre-cooked shrimp tempura and we're gonna lay them down in the center. I'm gonna pick the best pieces. And we're also going to take our cucumbers and lay them down as well. Just a couple of pieces. And our avocado. Make sure you have clean hands when handling this. <laughs> Now we are going to roll it up and squish all of that stuff into the middle, like so. And if it looks like this, that's okay, because we're going to be smushing it down even more. We're going to roll it this way. We want the seaweed to stick with the rice. That's what keeps everything in the roll. And we can take it off. Yeah, smush it down. 
as much as you can to give it that shape. And it should look like this. should look like and we are gonna cut it but I put plastic wrap over it beforehand because when you're cutting it it tends to stick to the knife the rice so keeping the plastic will make it easier to cut through each piece so we're gonna go ahead and do that There you have it. All the pieces cut up. You can throw this away after. This is what your sushi should look like. Thank you for following along with this video. Hopefully your sushi turned out delicious. How to replenish your curls after straightening your hair. My hair has been straightened for a few days now, but it is always important to use heat protectant when using heat on your hair. These are the products you will need. Moisturizing shampoo and conditioner, leave-in conditioner, curl cream, mousse, and gel. And optional, a nourishing hair mask. First thing in the shower is you're going to go in with the moisturizing shampoo. I like to use a scalp massager. If you're using a hair mask, read the directions on the back to properly use it. Mine says to use after shampooing and let it sit for 15 minutes. Next use your conditioner. I like to use a brush to help detangle my hair when using the conditioner. Upon getting out of the shower, use a leave-in conditioner while your hair is still wet. Your hair will be very dry after using heat, so this step is very important. Always use a wide tooth comb to brush your hair when it is wet out of the shower. Next, we are going to use a curl cream. I get mine at the drugstore from the brand Not Your Mother's Curl Talk. Next, we are going to go in with our mousse. Make sure to shake up the can before using it. Scrunch this into your hair with your head at all different angles. You know you're doing it right if you hear this. Next, we're going to scrunch the gel into our hair. Now, plop your hair with an oversized t-shirt to reduce frizz. Make sure to lay this out on a flat surface. Allow this to sit for 20 minutes. After taking your hair out of the shirt, you can choose to diffuse it or allow it to air dry. Here's the before and after. If you would have told me five years ago that I'd be a self-published author, I'd call you crazy. But now that that's a reality, I want to show you how I went from this to this. So let's dive right into it. Mm -hmm. 
Now, you want to write and publish a book. So where do you start? Before even thinking about publishing, you got to come up with an idea and brainstorm. So how do you do that if you're struggling? Personally, what I like to do is I like to draw from my life. So take the successes, the struggles, the good, the bad, and write it all down. Put it into different categories and then attach that to what genre you're interested in writing in and take it from there. There's a couple other ways you can do it, but personally, that's what I like to do so that the themes that I'm talking about can be consistent when I'm writing throughout any genre. Okay, step two. Now that you've got that award-winning idea, what do you do next? Well, you may or may not plan. There's three ways to go about your book. You could be a planner, someone who outlines their entire book before they put pen to paper on their first draft. You could be a panster who doesn't make an outline for their book and kind of lets their character take control of their own story. Or you could be a mix of both, which is a planster. You might have some sort of outline or guidance for your book, but you still let your creative juices flow. No matter which way you choose, make sure that it fits your book and what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, this next step isn't really a step, more so a tip for overcoming writer's block. Writer's block is something that every writer will face. So if you're going through this, don't worry, there will be a way out. Now, a few ways I like to go about this. One, I like to listen to music. I listen to music while I'm writing, but if I ever have writer's block, sometimes I just step away from my laptop and just listen to music. And I try to listen to songs that capture the emotion that I'm trying to write about that I'm currently blocked on. So that's one tip. Another tip, step away from your laptop. Take a walk, exercise, do something to get your mind off your story because tired writing isn't always the best writing, nor should you force it. Lastly, another thing I like to do is reread what I've written. I like to go up a few pages or chapters and really see what my story is, what I'm missing, what plot holes there are, so I can get more connected with my story. Okay, step three. Now you figured out the way that you're gonna go about planning your book. What do you do now? You write your first draft. Now, for a lot of writers, this can be daunting at first because you might get caught up with the voices in your head telling you this isn't a good story. But trust me, you got to keep writing and persevering through. And don't worry so much about editing because you're meant to have a first draft and your first draft will not be perfect. Just accept that. Okay, now for step four, it's time to edit. Congrats on finishing your first draft. You're already halfway through the process. Now, before you run and go buy an editor to do developmental editing, proofreading, or line editing, you need to edit your book yourself. You need to go in, see if the story's flowing the way that you want it to. Do your own proofreading and just get a little more closure with your story. Then you can go out and find an editor. But that leads me to the next step. So step five, it's officially time to start thinking about publishing. Now, when I said that editing is going to tie into this, it depends on the type of publishing that you're gonna do. So there's two types. You've got self-publishing and traditional publishing. Now I'm a self-published author, which means that I had pretty much all the control over my book. But that also came with some additional costs like my cover and editing and other things like that. So note that if you're going to self-publish, you're going to have to take on a majority of the costs by yourself. Now if you traditionally publish, then it's a little bit different. What you have to do is you have to find an agent who's going to help get your manuscript or you know your book of what you've written and you have to get an agent that will help you get your manuscript into a publishing house. And once you get that into a publishing house, you'll get a down payment for your book, which can range depending on the type of book that you have. And they will cover the editing, your cover, and your marketing. However, with that, you lose some of the creative control that you would have with self-publishing. So figure out what will work best for your book and if it will affect your wallet or not. Okay, now the last step 
However, it's important to note that this step needs to be implemented throughout all the other steps that I talked about. And what is that? Marketing. Now, whether you self-publish or traditionally publish, marketing should be consistent throughout. And what I mean by that is when you're writing your first draft, when you're brainstorming, when you're thinking about your cover, when you're editing, whatever step you're in when you're writing your book, market it, make a video, talk about it online so that you can engage readers. And I say this because I made that mistake when I was trying to self-publish my book. I was consumed by the fear that I might not publish my book, so I waited until I actually held it in my hand. And I realized that was a big mistake because no one knew about my book. I didn't have an audience or anything, so it took me a while to build up a following that would be interested in reading my book. So make sure that whatever step you're in, you're consistently letting your audience and readers know about what you have going on in your life. So that's how to write and publish a book. Now, if you're still struggling, I have a podcast called What Don't You Know, where I'll be diving into these steps further. Another great resource is to look at Readsy because they have industry workers who are knowledgeable on all of these steps as well. And lastly, just look at TikTok and YouTube and other platforms where writers and authors are sharing their stories like myself. I hope you enjoyed this video and good luck on your writing journey. This was how to write and publish a book. So first I'm wedging the clay, getting all the air pockets out so it's easier to throw on the wheel. Gotta slap it onto the wheel just so it sticks better, so it's, the clay's not flying all around. And then putting a lot of pressure around the clay just to get it centered makes it easier to pull up the walls. And at this point, I'm getting my hands a little wet so I can sink my hole. And at this point, you can start pulling up the walls. Whereas here, you can figure out what kind of shape you want it to do. So here, I'm throwing a vase. I want to have rounder walls and like a flare up top. And then with a sponge, I'm just smoothing out the all around the clay. And this is my favorite satisfying part. And then now that I have that nice round shape, I'm just pulling it up more to make sure the walls are nice and even. And then finally, I'm flaring out the top to make it look more vase-like. And then before I take it off the wheel, I'm trimming the bottom. And then once it's dried a little bit, I'm trimming it. I'm gonna take it off the wheel so I can trim it. And right
right here I'm just trimming the foot I'm not gonna have like a prominent foot I'm just trimming it so it sits and then here it's all done trimmed and then you put it in the kiln for the first bisque firing and then after the firing you can now glaze your pot I chose a dark green And then I'm gonna dip it into pink over top. And in the kiln, the chemicals are gonna react a whole bunch of different ways and it's gonna turn out super pretty. And then you put it in the kiln for the second time. This is for a glaze firing. And then it's done, super pretty, yay. Hey everyone, today we're going to be showing you a simple craft you can make for your loved ones for Valentine's Day. Here's a list of your materials. You will need three different colors of pipe cleaners, including green, and scissors to cut them at different lengths. First, take the pipe cleaner you will use for your petals. Cut the pipe cleaners into six equal parts. Now, take the pipe cleaner you will use for the center of the flower. Next, grab your green pipe cleaner for the stem. Fold it, cut it in half into two parts, and move the rest to the side. Grab the stem and the center pipe cleaners. Cross them perpendicular to one another and twist together. Take the six petals and hold them around the center. Grab the other half of the green pipe cleaner, wrapping it around all of the other pieces in order to hold the petals in place. Keep twisting it until it hides the center and the petals. Now, pull apart the flower petals. Take the center of your flower and roll it up into a circle. Finally, repeat the same action for each petal. Roll all six up, surrounding the center. And now you've completed your flower. The process is the same for each one, so make a bouquet of however many you want.